Amen. The throne of grace, Revelation chapter 4. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. Now, last week we just looked at a few verses and we looked at the throne room. And we know that in order for us to get a heavenly perspective, we need to look at, we, we need to spend time in the throne room. We need to spend time in prayer with the Lord. And then we can get a heavenly perspective. Now, we looked at the book of Daniel, and if you remember, the 70 weeks of Daniel, which is a prophecy in the book of Daniel, chapter 9. And that prophecy takes you from the time of the, the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem all the, way, all the way to Messiah the Prince, which is Jesus Christ. And that would be the, um, the triumphal entry when Jesus Christ rode into Jerusalem and presented himself as Messiah. In fact, we talked about that that prophecy, if you kind of do the math, it, it gets you down to the exact day, which was April the 6th, 32 um, A.D., so they could have known when, the Messiah, when, when Jesus was going to actually come to, come to this world, when he was going to be born, basically, and when he was going to ride into um, Jerusalem during the triumphal entry to be presented as the Messiah. They knew the time frame. They knew the exact date if they just would have believed and if they would have focused on the prophecy. And so it tells you it's going to be um, 69 weeks. Then there's going to be a gap a time period which which we refer to as the church age and so it's a gap between the 69th week and the 70th week now those are when we talk about a week that's seven days right in in this prophecy it's seven years so the 70th week is the tribulation period so if you look at the the time of if this was the the day that god um, told nehemiah to to rebuild the walls, the commandment to restore and to rebuild Jerusalem. And it took 49 years. And so if the prophecy started at that point, and it takes you up, and if, if this is all, all of the 70 weeks right here, so the 69 weeks takes you right up to here, and then there's a, everything stops. And that's the church age. Israel rejected their Messiah, and so now you have the time period of the church that we like it says in, in um, the book of Romans, we were grafted in. So now you have the church where you have Jew and Gentile together. The nation of Israel rejected Jesus Christ. They crucified him. And so now you have the church age. He is crucified. He died. He was buried. He rose again. He ascended into heaven. And right at, at, on the day of Pentecost, and that's when I believe the church began, so from Pentecost till today, you have the church age. That's where we are. The church age is going to be, is going to conclude. It's going to end at the rapture. So the, sev the, 69, uh, the 69 weeks and, and then the gap period of time, the church age, and then the 70th week of Daniel is, we, we also refer to that as what? The 70th week of Daniel is the tribulation. So in the book of Revelation, the outline is John, that John was to write down the things that were. That's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. He did that already. The things which are the church age. Because that's what we're happening. That's a present. We're in the church age. And... Then he's to write down what the things that's going to happen. That's from chapter 4 to chapter 22. That's all future. That's the outline of Revelation. Chapter 1, the things that were. Chapter 2 and 3, the church. The word church is mentioned 19 times. From chapter 4 to chapter 22, how many times is it mentioned? Zero. Why? The church is in heaven. In chapters 4 and 5, the church is in the throne room. And chapter 4, we see, you know, that that's what we're talking about today. And in chapter 5, we're going to see he who sits on the throne, Jesus Christ. And that's chapters 4 and 5. The church is in the throne room. What's happening on earth? The tribulation period. And that's going to go from chapter 6 to chapter 19. 
the tribulation period is going to conclude with the battle of what? Armageddon. Armageddon simply means the plain of Megiddo. You can, you can go there in, uh, when you go to Israel and you're on, the, on Mount Carmel, you look down upon the plain of Megiddo. That's where it's going to be. So it's going to take place. A lot of battles have been fought there. And that's the battle of Armageddon. And we who have been up in heaven for the seven, that during the tribulation period, we're in heaven at the judgment seat of Christ. And then also we are going to have um, crowns to cast at his feet at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then after, we are going to come back with Jesus Christ on white horses. And then he is going to destroy the enemies of God with the sword of his mouth, which is the word of God. And then he is going to come down um, on the, he's going to come down on, onto the earth. Like it says in the book of Acts, as he ascended into heaven from the Mount of, of Olives, he's going to come back down. And he is going to go into the, the temple through the eastern gate, also known as the beautiful gate. When you're on the Mount of Olives, you can look at that gate. Right now, it's sealed, sealed shut. And, and, it's gonna, and Jesus Christ is going to go, the mountain is going to cleave uh, from the north and the south. Because there's a cemetery right on the Mount of Olives. That was, uh, there was a cemetery purposefully planted, uh, placed there um, because, um, what's that, Emperor Suleiman the Not-So-Magnificent, Suleiman the Magnificent. He put it there because he knew that that's the prophecy said the Messiah is going to come into the Eastern Gate. And he knows that a Jew cannot defile himself and then go into the temple. So he puts a cemetery there because if you go to a cemetery or you touch a dead body or you're on a grave, then you are defiled. Well, the mountain is going to split. <laughs> so there's not going to be any defilement. He's going to walk right into the Eastern Gate that that same um, emperor shut because he didn't want, he wanted to shut out the Messiah, not knowing that he actually tried to stop prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, because in Ezekiel chapter 40, says that the eastern gate will be shut. And he's going to go right into the eastern gate, and he's going to set up his first order of business. It's going to be judgment, separating the sheep and the goat. The sheep and the goat judgments and the other judgments to follow. And then that's going to begin in chapter 20 of Revelation, the millennial reign, 1,000-year reign, where you and I will rule and reign with Jesus Christ on this earth for 1,000 years. And the devil will be chained up for 1,000 years. Also, at that time, the beast and a false, false prophet are going to be sent to hell. They're going to be there for 1,000 years. And at the end of the 1,000 years, the devil is going to be released. And then at that time, this, you, you can read about this in chapter 19 and chapter 20. In fact, maybe go read it today after to see what, what I'm saying. This is, what, this is what it's about. Chapter 20 is the millennial reign. At the end of the millennial reign is going to be the last and final conflict, conflict where the devil is going to be released and there's going to be people that follow the devil. You're going to say, why would they do that after being on... Because uh, there's going to be people that survive the tribulation that are going to go into the millennial kingdom with their, with their uh, earthly bodies. We are already... If you're here, if you're saved now and you're raptured, you're going to come back down to this earth and we're, also, we're going to be given our new bodies. We don't know how all the details are going to be, but we're going to rule and reign with him on this earth. And I don't want to get into too much detail about that. I talked about that before, how, the, how we as, um, we're, going to, we're, we're going to have our new bodies. And so we're going to be ruling and reigning with Jesus with people that have not been given their earthly bodies. They will reproduce. There's going to be, I mean, a thousand years is people are going to live really long. And there's going to be a lot of people born during that time period. And then at the, at the end, the devil's going to be uh, released, and they're going to have, because they never had an opportunity to be tempted from the devil. They're going to be given that chance, and many are going to follow him. Why? Why do people follow him today? <laughs> Why do we, we even do sometimes what we do? And then there's going to be that last final conflict, and then the devil's at that point is going to be cast into the lake of fire, where the Bible says in chapter 20, where the beast and the false prophet still are. They're still there. Some people believe that hell is going to, you know, when someone's cast into hell, they're just going to be burned up. Well, the beast and the false prophet are human beings cast into hell. They're there for a thousand years. They're still there at the end of the thousand years. And then the, the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. And the Bible says that he will be sh shut up. He'll finally be done. 
and then he'll be in, in hell in the lake of fire. And then you're going to have the last and final judgment, the great, the great white throne judgment. It's all chapter 20. Chapter 21 and 22, it's about the new heavens and the new earth where we're going to live happily ever after. Just like every fairy tale is like that. The Bible, all the fairy tales, they just took the, the Bible basically and they kind of made it into their own story, kind of, sort of. I don't want to go into that too, but it always ends with that, live happily ever after. That only happens really truly in the Bible, in chapter 21 and 22. So that's the story. So right now we're in chapter 4. This is all future. We started off last week with verse 1 says, come up hither. And John is caught up. And the word caught up, that's where we get the word rapture from. First Thessalonians chapter 4, that, that we're going to be caught up. And we are going to meet, meet with him in the clouds. That's not the second coming where he comes out to the Mount Olivet. We're going to meet him halfway in the clouds. And then we're, that's the, the church being raptured. And so that's what we see in Revelation, chapter 2 and 3, church age. Chapter 4, rapture. And in the throne room, 4 and 5. And in chapter 6 through 19 is a tribulation period. Okay, so we saw the, the beginning parts of this chapter, the throne room. Now, this... this um, this lesson is titled the throne of grace and i'm going to explain why basically it's called that it says in hebrews 4 16 let us therefore come boldly unto the what the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need so now you see in cha in uh, this chapter chapter four and we're going to begin with verse five it says and out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices so that is the coming storm if you see in the distance lightning flash you see clouds you can see the the, uh, the storm is approaching and that's what's that that's kind of the scene that is um painted that's depicted here that there's a storm coming what is it it's a storm of judgment judgment is coming what judgment is coming what judgment is coming? The what? No, that's not a judgment. That's when we're caught up. What judgment is coming on the earth? The tribulation. The tribulation is coming. So John sees this. The church is caught up. The coming, the judgment is coming. But John sees the judgment coming, but he sees it from the throne of grace. Because you and I who are saved, we receive grace. We receive mercy. So we're not going to be judged because it's a throne of grace. Even though the judgment comes from God, God is the one that's judging this world. A world that has rejected him. The Bible says Jesus came into his own and his own what? They received him not. A world that has rejected him. A world that so casually and flippantly uses God's name in vain. What if somebody had used your, your mother, your father's name in a, in a cuss word, in a way of cursing? What would you say to that? They do that. They, the world does that to the Lord's name all the time. They, they blaspheme his name. They curse his name. They reject his name. They mock his people. They mock his word. They make fun of the things of God. And God is not letting it pass. He's not just saying, it's all right. He's not the old man upstairs on a rocking chair that's just kind of like, ah, you know, it's okay. No. It's all building up, building up, building up. Judgment is coming. Why hasn't it not come yet? Because God is long-suffering. He is merciful. And we might say, oh, I wish the Lord would just judge him already. But what we got to think, what if it was still us in our lost condition? Aren't we glad that God was merciful to us? Well, we ought to be glad that God is merciful also to those that have not gotten saved yet. But there's going to come a day where the time is going to have run out. So the storm is coming. But John sees it from, the, from his um, perspective as a throne of grace. We talk about the rainbow. The rainbow was God's covenant sign, right? That he would not destroy the world with a flood anymore. And so God... He has to see that he, he is going to judge, but he has to, be, he has to be true to his covenant, the covenants that he made. And so the covenant that he has made is the covenant of grace. The rainbow symbolizes that covenant. And we know that it's a, it's a rainbow, but there's an emerald green color. 
because that speaks of life. So the promise of eternal life is guaranteed because of his grace. And that's what John sees. So he knows that there's judgment coming, but not for the believer. God is on his throne of judgment, and he will judge those that are lost. But at the same time, he is also the God of grace that comes down from the throne and takes the punishment for those that trusted in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's what this chapter is basically about, the throne of grace. This is an awesome chapter. It's very encouraging. It's a very encouraging chapter where we as a sinful people who have sinned in the past and still sin, we are now saved. So we will not get judged. Why? Because the judgment was already placed upon Jesus. So we go free and we receive mercy. That's what it's all about. So the storm, the coming storm in Titus 3, 5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Mercy. What is mercy? Mercy is God withholding that which we deserve. Grace is God giving us what we do not deserve. See how that works? So in God's grace, he gives us what we don't deserve, eternal life. God, in his mercy, withholds judgment upon us that we do deserve, which is hell. And so we see that this is a throne of grace that we receive mercy. It's good news. Is it exciting? It's not a day. I, say, I feel like everyone's kind of like, I don't know if it's just everyone's kind of tired and dead today. Or if it's just because I can't hear. <laughs> Because I caught this ear infection from somebody, I won't mention names, somebody to get, give me an ear infection. So I can't really hear out of this ear too well. It's like a weird sound. So I'm, so I'm like, is everyone just tired or just I'm, I'm just not all there myself? Maybe I'm the only one that's dead. <laughs> so everyone just seems so dead today. Maybe it's just me. <laughs> but this is a, and the songs that were picked, did you know about all this? The song you sang is a special is the song they're singing on a throne. And then also we sang the song. What was the song? This, the, we sang Grace. Yeah. I'm like, man, who planned this? Did we like have a conference? So that's all good. So we see the storm. Next thing we see, the spirit. No, this is where. There's going to be a lot of, th I hope we're not dead today. I mean, like dead tired. I mean, I know we're alive physically, but because there's going to be a lot of thinking going on today. <laughs> a lot of pictures, so that'll help. I have like the Farrington and Wainai graduates. So, you know, Farrington, you know. Koku. Nah, don't want to say that. Still scared of playing Kahuku football. Very traumatizing. You ever been traumatized as a child? Play Kahuku football. At Kahuku. You'll never get over it. Farrington is not too fun either. <laughs> yeah, they threw rocks at our bus. But I'm, I'm over it, though. They stole our bus, but that's okay. I'm over it. Oh, yeah. Because we won. How dare us. <laughs> Coming by the overpass. <laughs> Duck, everybody. <laughs> Not. He wouldn't enough. He wouldn't enough. Only because we want. Okay, moving on. We're going to throw in the grace. <laughs> get, the get the blood pumping a little bit. Okay, so this is what I have to say. That. The tabernacle is a shadow. It is basically a shadow of what's in heaven. Now, what's in heaven is the throne. What is on earth is the tabernacle. The tabernacle is patterned after the throne room. So that's what we got to understand. Now, let me read this verse. In Hebrews 8, verse 5, the Bible says, Who serve unto the example, of uh, an example and shadow of heavenly things, as Moses was admonished of God. 
So the example in shadow, the tabernacle was a shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee on the mount. God showed him the pattern on how to make the tabernacle because it is patterned after the throne. So when you're looking at the throne, that is basically the mercy seat on which was the Ark of the Covenant. And then that was the headquarters, basically. The, the Holy of Holies is where the Ark was. And, the, and you had the Holy Place and the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle. And that was where God resided with his people. That represented the presence of God. That's where the, some people refer to the Shekinah glory, the smoke, the glory cloud. That's where it was, in the Holy of Holies. That's the throne room that he's in. So we see that picture here in chapter 4. Now it says here, And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Now we know that no one can look upon God at any time. So when you see God manifest to us where we could see him, like the Bible says in Genesis, let there be light. That's Jesus Christ. He is the word. That's where God comes to where we can understand him. And that the word became flesh. That's Jesus Christ. So we see that God, who is a trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, is on the throne. We see the, the red, we see the light that was given off by the, by the uh, sardis and the sardine stone. We looked at, at or, or the jasper and the sardine stone we looked at last week, like a diamond reflecting the color red, speaks of the blood of Jesus. So you see God in his fullness on the throne. And it says, and out of, the th or, um, yeah, out of the throne proceed lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. That represents the Holy Spirit, the seven spirits. But that is also when you come into the holy place of the tabernacle, you come to, that's the first room right there, you see it? That's a menorah, and it has seven lights on it. And that speaks of, like in a throne room, the seven spirits of God. And so when you come into the tabernacle, it's patterned after the throne room where you have the seven spirits of God. And here you have, you see a menorah. And then you also, when, when, when you came into the holy place, that's what you would see. The menorah would be on the left, and on the right you had the table of showbread, and in the front you had the, the altar of the incense. Now we're going to look at the altar of incense in chapter 8. The altar of incense is going to talk about that that speaks of the prayers of the saints. And that's where the Every day, every morning, well, twice a day, when they would go and they would do the things that they had to do, they trim the lamps, and they, um, they'd partake of the bread, and they'd replace it, and then they had to go to the altar of incense. They would take a burning coal from off of the uh, brazen altar, and they'd, you know, they would put it on the altar of incense, and then they'd take that special um, fragrance, that incense, and they'd pour it on the, on, on the coal that they took from the brass altar, and that would speak of the prayers of the saints. And, of course, they'd be praying for the Messiah to come. And all that smell, that, that incense smell would get all over them, and they'd smell good. And when they came outside, people would say, whoa, you spend time with the Lord, huh, because of the fragrance. That incense could only be made for God. You couldn't just buy it. Oh, I want to, no, you can't fabricate it. If you did, you were gonna, you're going to be, some say executed, some say kicked out of the camp. And remember when they tried to take a, put a different fire upon that altar? Things didn't go too well. For Aaron's sons, right, when they did that. So you had to do things according to the way God wanted it because it all spoke of Jesus Christ. It all spoke of salvation. So they would come in there, and that's the um, holy place. Now, you see there's a veil. Now, behind that veil is going to be is the, is the Ark of the Covenant. So this right there we see is the tabernacle that was patterned after the throne in heaven. So this is like... Uh, shadowy or similitude or a replica in a sense on earth of what John is seeing in heaven. So he sees the seven spirits of God or the, or, or the Holy Spirit in his fullness. Seven is the number of completion or perfection. And that's what also the menorah speaks of. So in heaven, there's a door as we talked about last week. And in the tabernacle, there is also a door. Can you go back one? You see what that arrow says there? The door. 
the door into the holy place. And Jesus also, he said, I am the door. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh into the Father but by me. And then, of course, John, in chapter 4, verse 1, it speaks about a door. So what in heaven, what, what you see in heaven is patterned. In the, the tabernacle is patterned after what John is seeing in heaven. Okay, so you have the menorah. Then also, there is on uh, verse 6, the sea. Remember we talked about the sea? It was just this, like this um, glassy sea, just like a sheet of glass. Well, there was a sea also in the tabernacle. It's called the laver. And it was a, like a basin. And, you know, when they would go from the brazen altar and they'd sacrifice the, the, the animals and they're walking on a dirt floor, they get dirty. And they would always wash at that laver. And the laver speaks of cleansing. You know, the Bible says if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So you have the sea. It says, and before the throne, there was a sea of glass like into crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. So now when you would go into, you had the holy place and then you had the holy of holies. Go to the, the next slide. So that's the, the labor. That speaks of the, the sea. See, everything is, you see how it's patterned? Okay, go to the, the next one. This is the holy place again. And then when you go, there you see the veil right there. Do you notice on that veil, what is that? Those two um, cherubims. Cherubims on the veil. Keep that in the back of your mind. Okay, go to the next one. Okay, you see there, right there? This side of it is the holy place. And then you see the veil right there? And then when he goes through the veil, what's that? That's the Ark of the Covenant. Okay, go to the next slide. Now that's the Ark of the Covenant. It's kind of like there's a window. It didn't look like this, you know, but just so we could see what's in it. So the Ark of the Covenant had in it three things. We can see them there so we know, right? You had, well, I don't know if you can see Aaron's rod there, but you can see it? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah, I can see it. I can see it better on this one. Anyway, so you have the Ten Commandments, right? Then you also have a pot of manna. You see that? This is the real one too, by the way. No, no. <laughs> and then you have Aaron's rod that budded. These are three items that all speaks of Jesus Christ. He is the word of God, right? Manna speaks of Jesus Christ. He's the one that came down from heaven, right? And fed the people. He said, Jesus said, I'm the bread of life. The Bible says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, that's Jesus, the Holy Ghost, these three are one. And then also there's Aaron's rod that budded. So the children of Israel, one day, some of them were saying, Hey, what? What, how come Moses is the one in charge? What, does God only speak to Moses? Well, who made Moses in charge? Of course, God did, right? <laughs> you know, sometimes... When people have a problem with the person that's leading them, the children of Israel had that problem with Moses sometimes. You ever have a problem with your boss? You ever have a problem with, well, I know, I mean, you know, I'm a problem with your pastor, you know, that's me, and I know that's what happened. <laughs> but that's, man is, I mean, you ever have a problem with your parents, the teenagers? <laughs> but sometimes we have a problem with authority, right? So the children of Israel, they had that problem. And they're saying, well, who do you think you are, Moses? Well, God can only speak to you. <laughs> well, we, we can, God can speak to us, and we can, we can get the word from God, and we can tell people what to, what to do. So then Moses fell on his face before God. He prayed, and God spoke to Moses and said, Okay, I tell you what, Moses, what you do. Tell all of these guys that thinks they're the ones to lead. Have them bring their... Their rods, like their walking sticks. 
Have them bring their rods. And then, Moses, you bring Aaron's rod, because Aaron is the high priest. And then we'll put, cast these rods before me. Come back the next day, and let's see whose rod has life in it. And so they came back the next day, and Aaron's rod had budded. What does that speak of? This is a rod that was just a dead piece of wood. And from this dead piece of wood came forth life. Now, that speaks of Jesus Christ as our high priest, as our mediator. The Bible says there is, uh, there is um, one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So all of this speaks of Jesus Christ. He is, uh, he is the mediator. And so when they came that next day, Aaron's rod was budded and theirs was not, showing everyone that this is where the life is. This is where God is speaking. Because you know what really speaks to people or shows people that what you have and what I have is real? Fruit. And fruit came from this dead piece of wood. That also speaks of the cross. The dead piece of wood that life comes from the tree, comes from the cross because of what Jesus did on the cross for our sin. So now, these three items also reminded the children of Israel of their failures. In fact, when Moses was getting the Ten Commandments, what were they doing? They were parting. They were worshiping the golden calf. And so then Moses, they, broke, they were breaking God's commandment as he was receiving it. And so he breaks it, right? And then he has to get new ones. And God gave him duplicates. And then those duplicates were placed in the ark. And it spoke of the fact that they broke God's word, bro broke God's command. They, were re they rebelled against God's authority because God put Moses in charge. So they're not really only rebelling against Moses. They're rebelling against God, which is what you do when you rebel against a, a, an ordained authority. You know, the Bible says that obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. And it goes against our flesh a lot of times but these items spoke of the um, the problems the sin the rebellion of the of the children of Israel and then of course the manna the manna came down from heaven right here comes down the manna and the children of Israel God gave it to them to feed them to provide um, nourishment nutrients to them and when the manna came down from heaven after a while what what did the children of Israel say what is this? That's why it's called manna. You know what the word manna means? What is it? <laughs> That's what manna means. And then they started to try to make all kind of different stuff out of it, right? They even tried to make what? Manapua. <laughs> they made manapua out of it. That was Robert's joke. I stole it. They made all kind of manna stuff, right? And um, they, didn't, you know, they didn't like it. They wanted meat. We want meat. We tired of this manna. So God gave them quail, right? They had so much quail, it started coming out of their nostrils. They had too much quail. So all of these represents their failures. That when, when, when God would look down upon the ark, he sees they broke the commands, they rejected, um, and they rebelled against my authority. They murmured and complained about the manna I provided. They complained about my provision. They, they rebel against authority. They break the commandments. Doesn't that remind you of somebody? Who does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of? Who does that remind you of, Amber? Yourself. That's right, because it reminds me of you too. <laughs> no, it reminds me of me. I mean, here you have in the, in the Ark of the Covenant these items that reminded them of the fact that they broke God's command. They rejected and rebelled against his authority. They, they rejected him. They didn't want him. They didn't want the manna. They didn't want the things that God provided for them, and they complained about it. You know, sometimes we're so, um, what's that called? We have so much imagination, and we're so creative. We can complain about all the blessings God gives to us. You know, some, you know, people are in the uh, United States of America where we have 
If you are the poorest person in the United States of America, you are still in the upper 10% of the richest people in the world. Because there are some poor people out there. There are some people who don't even eat every day. We live in a country where we have freedom. We have so much. So what, does that, what happens? We, we complain. People complain about our country. Pick another one. Go to another country and see what it's like. We live in a great country. It's not perfect, obviously. There's many problems. And I believe that there are uh, some evil people trying to destroy this country. And yes, there's problems. Yes, there's problems of things that happened in the past. But don't go there. Don't be a complaining person because God hates complaining. The Bible says that when the people complain, it displeased the Lord. And he heard it. And he disciplined them as a result. He says, you guys want to complain? I'll give you something to complain about. And he sends serpents to bite them. Because that's what's happening when you and I complain. It's like we're getting bit by the serpent, the devil. Because we're complaining. And try go the rest of the day without complaining. I bet you cannot. I mean, I do it all the time, but I bet you cannot. <laughs> yeah, every night when I sleep, I don't complain not one time. <laughs> Although I had a very weird dream. Very weird dream last night. Yeah, there was a particular individual. We'll not mention his name. Yeah, we're at, we're at church. And this guy got upset. He was just mad. He was all on drugs, all wasted. And he had a hammer. I says, you better, you better get out of here. He goes, I'm going to throw this hammer at you. I said, go throw it at me. Boom, he threw the hammer at me and hit me in my head. And then he ran. And I told the brothers, get him. <laughs> and then I guess it's not too bad if I mention someone's name, yeah. He ran, and then, I won't mention the person's name, but the person picked him up and slammed him. No. <laughs> What's Pohaku? Because <laughs> he do jujitsu after. And I was like, I could have done that. But I couldn't catch him. I was too slow. You ever try running your dream? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can't catch him. What a weird dream to have, yeah? <sighs> yeah, I woke, I woke up and Roxanne is punching me in my head now. <laughs> no. No. That was my dream, though. Why did I say that? I don't know. But as they say in AA, thanks, you for, thanks for letting me share. So those were the, the three items in there. So God looked upon upon these items that the children of Israel broke because they rebelled against his authority. They rejected him. They complained. They basically failed. They were failures. You ever feel like a failure? You ever feel like you failed? You ever read Romans chapter 7 where Apostle Paul was saying the things I want to do, I don't do. The things I don't want to do, I do. Oh, wretched man that I am. So that's the Ark of the Covenant. But fortunately, upon the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. Okay, can you turn it to the next one? You see that? Mercy seat. The mercy seat consisted of cherubim with their outstretched arm. Now, if we are talking about Revelation chapter 4 as a throne of grace where we receive mercy, what do you expect to see in a throne room? Huh? What do you expect to see? Cherubim. You expect to see some cherubim. Now, all the points started with S, okay? You see that? The storm, the spirit, the sea. So now we're going to see seraphim, not cherubim. You know why? Because where, everywhere I look, no one really knows if they're cherubim or seraphim. Who knows the difference? Now, these cherubim slash seraphim, are, they look just like what's described in Ezekiel, right? But they also look like what's described in Isaiah as seraphim. Why? The seraphim had six wings. The cherubim had four wings. So a lot of times people are saying, 
We don't know what they are. Most people say they're cherubim. Some people say they're seraphim. Some people say they're kind of like a mixture. Maybe they're their own thing, you know, a different one that's not named. Whatever they are, it works better for, ser- for it to be seraphim because it starts with an S. Because <laughs> all the other points started with S, so we went with seraphim. So we see that there are this seraphim. Now look at verse 6 again. And look at the point where it says seraphim. And before the throne there was a sea of glass likened to crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts, or if you take that word beast, it's, it, in, in the Greek it comes out to be living creatures. These living creatures, full of eyes before and behind. So these eyes, it speaks of the fact that they had insight, that they had knowledge, that they weren't just robots. They were very intelligent creatures, these seraphim, these cherubim. Seraphim and cherubim are angelic creatures that were seen around the throne or to protect the holiness of God. Now we first see um, cherubim in Genesis Remember when, um, when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit and then God, uh, he had to clothe them and then he kicked them out of the Garden of Eden? There was a particular tree called the Tree of Life that if you ate of that tree, you would live forever. And God did not want them to live forever in their sinful condition. He wanted them to get saved first because if they ate in a sinful condition, then they would have never been able to get saved. They would have been sinners for eter- for, for, for There would have been... They, they would have been basically bound for hell for eternity. They would have been separated from God forever. So God, in his grace and mercy, puts cherubim there to protect them from partaking of the tree of life. Cherubim. Now, we see these, as I mentioned, in Ezekiel 1. So I'm going to read. It's right in the notes, these verses. Ezekiel 1, verse 5, and also verse 10. It says, And out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Verse 10. As for the likeness of their faces, they four had the face of a man, the face of a lion on the right side, they had had the face of an ox on the left side, and they also had the face of an eagle. So they had four faces. The face of a lion, the face of an ox, the face of a man, and the face of an eagle. These living creatures have the same faces. That's why we say cherubim. But they have six wings, like the seraphim. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Upon, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face. With twain he covered his feet. And with twain he did fly. One cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. So this is Isaiah seeing the throne. So what are they? Seraphim, cherubim. So they had eyes before and behind, which speaks of insight and intelligence. They're not blind instruments or robots. They're not robotic and repeating, holy, holy, holy. They do this out of their own free will because they see the Lord and who he is and they cry out, holy, holy, holy. They know and understand and have greater insight and perception than any man. So you can see on the throne, go to the the next slide. Oh, that's the next one. You don't have the, the faces? No. Well, you see it on your paper, right? You see the ox, the eagle, the man, and the lion. So it says, that it says here in, in, in our text, the first beast was like a lion. The second beast, beast like a calf. The third beast had a face as a man. And the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings. So you see that matches Isaiah's description, right? But then the four faces, it, it goes along with Ezekiel's description of the cherubim. The four beasts each had six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night. 
saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which is what the seraphim did, right? Which was and is and is to come. That means he's eternal. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever. So we first see the, ch the cherubim in, in the cherubim in Genesis. Cherub means one, cherubim, that's plural. Because I was trying to write cherubims, and it didn't let me. It said, no, that's not a word. Yeah, because that is plural. <laughs> so you learn something. Kind of like mice. You don't say mice is, right? Galatians 3.24. Well, I mean, yeah, maybe some people do. I don't know. I do? No, I don't. I don't say mice is. Some people say mouse is. You say mouse is, yeah? Yeah. It's mice, by the way. In Galatians 3.24, I mean, Genesis 3.24, it says, So he drove out the man. He placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubims and a flaming sword which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life. So the cherubim have, the cherubim have faces that picture the four Gospels. The face of a man goes along with the book of Luke where Jesus Christ is pictured as the Son of Man. A lot of the parables will be in the... Okay. Where do you think the parable of the Good Samaritan is? What book? Luke. Right. Where do you think the story of the prodigal son is? Luke. It's kind of a set question. Anyway. The face of a lion. That picture, that, that is the book of Matthew, which pictures Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. And in fact, in the book of Matthew, you're going to see a lot of the preaching, the preaching and the teaching. And he is, he, he, it, it pictures Jesus Christ as the king of the Jews. The book of Mark pictures Jesus Christ as a perfect servant. So when you study the book of Mark, you're not going to have the long um, sermons like you do in Matthew. You're going to have more of the action. Probably one of the funnest Gospels to read or to study is the book of Mark. It's a little shorter, it gets right to the point, and you see a lot of the action. And Jesus said this, that the greatest among you shall be your servant. He says that in what book? Mark. I think he says another book too, but I'm trying to make a point. So the face of an ox, an ox is a servant animal, and like a calf too. It, it, it's a, it's a, a beast of burden, they call it. So Mark pictures Jesus Christ as a servant. The eagle, that is the book of John, which pictured Jesus Christ as the Son of God. You know, an eagle could actually look at the sun, and it doesn't hurt his eyes. That's how the eagle defends itself against those little birds. Sometimes they fly around, and they peck at it, peck at it. He just flies up straight towards the sun, and they can't look at the sun, so they're, ah, and they fly away. That's what the eagle does. He flies up towards the sun. And so the eagle, that's the book of John. And each of these books have basically the teaching is geared for, like in the book of Matthew, is a book that is geared for reaching the Jews. And the book of, of Luke is a book that is um, geared for reaching the Greeks, the philosophers, that they kind of lifted up man like in a humanistic way because he was a wise philosopher. So it's geared to reaching the Greek. And in the Roman, uh, the book of Mark is, speaks of Romans, an action book. And then, of course, the book of John, it's there to reach the world. And, that, and each of these picture Jesus Christ in a different way. Luke pictures Jesus as the son of man or the perfect man. Matthew pictures Jesus Christ as the um, king of the Jews, the perfect king. Mark pictures Jesus Christ as the perfect servant. And John pictures Jesus Christ as the son of God. So these faces, some people believe, goes along with the Gospels. But more importantly than that, when the children of Israel were instructed to set up their camp, if you remember when we studied the book of Numbers, when they were supposed to set up camp, God had them set up around, what, what do you think is going to be in the middle of the camp? The tabernacle. 
Then you had the Levites. They're the ones that served the Lord. They were right around the tabernacle. By the way, if you want to have an exciting life, set up your life right around where all the action is. That's where the Levites were set up. They were set up right there in the center. Make the Lord the center of your life. If you want an action-packed, exciting life. If you want a boring, stressful, meaningless, empty life, go far away from the camp. But if you want an exciting, thrilling life, Get right where the action is in service to the Lord. So they have the tabernacle in the middle. Then all of the tribes had to set up around them. And they had to set up in a particular way. So in the, on the east side, you had the tribe of Judah, the tribe of Issachar, and the tribe of Zebulun. That's on the east side. And they had a gang sign. No, they had a flag. They had a symbol. And these three tribes were gathered together. And the leader of these three tribes was Judah. And the symbol was, what do you think the symbol of Judah is going to be? A lion. Jesus Christ is a lion in the tribe of Judah. Then on the west side, their gang sign was kind of like, I don't know how they make their fingers like they, they can make all kind of weird. They can spell out stuff with their hands. Yeah. Don't do that though right now. Oh, I see them on your hand right to your arm. You had Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. Ephraim was the leader among those three. And what do you think that their symbol was? Theirs was the ox. Then on the north, you had the tribe of Dan, Asher, Asher, and Naphtali. And Dan was the leader of, of those tribes. And their symbol was the eagle, their flag. Then on the south, you had Reuben, Reuben Simeon, and Gad. The, the leading tribe there was Reuben. And their symbol, their flag, was a man. That's the same faces of those living creatures. You see that? But the interesting thing, if you add up all the numbers, they had tents. So many would fit in a tent. So you had so many. So when, when, you, when they set up camp, the numbers that are given, look at the next slide. You see those numbers there? Okay, on the, on the east side is the tribe of Judah. You had 100... Oh, my goodness. 180,000 or so, something like that. I can't read. It's too small. <laughs> On the west side, you had 108,000. On the south side, you had 151,000. And on the north side, you had 150-something thousand. So the south and the north, they were basically even number. They're similar number, 150,000. So the setup was kind of looked the same. The biggest one was Judah, which was like 180, almost 200,000. That's on the east side. The smallest one was the camp of Ephraim, which was the west side. So when you looked down upon them, when you're flying your drone over the camp, and you took a picture, it would look like, turn on the next slide. Across. You see that? It was, they li were lined up in the shape of a cross. So there was this guy named Balak. He was the king of Moab. And he was afraid of the children of Israel because they were beating everybody. And they, he felt like he was going to lose to them. He didn't want to fight them. So he hires a prophet. The prophet's name was Balaam. He hired him. He says, if I like make some side cash. <laughs> oh, yeah. Shoots. Curse the children of Israel. No problem. He says, these people are so rebellious. They complain, right? They break the commandments. I'm sure God can't wait to curse them, right? You know, that's called the error of Balaam. Oh, yeah. That's easy money. Easy side job. Yeah. He climbs up upon a high mountain. And he's going to unleash the curse upon them. 
and he unleashes the curse. And what happens? It turns into a blessing. He's like, oh. And Balak says, brah. I pay you to curse him and you bless him. I like my money back. Like a couple slaps. That's what he said in the pigeon translation. So he was upset. Well, Balaam goes, well, I'm going to go to a different place. Maybe, you know, goes to a different place. Same thing. Goes to a different place. Same thing. He could not curse. Why? Because when he went to curse, God looked upon his people and said, I see them in the shape of the cross with the pictures of Jesus described with these signs, these flags. And now because I see them as a rebellious people, yes. A people that broke the commandments, yes. A people that rejected me, rejected the manna, they, they um, rejected my authority, they rebelled against everything I told them to do. But I see them through the cross. And that's why you and I have mercy. Do you feel like, a, do you feel like you broke the commandments? Do you feel like you failed? Well, you have. <laughs> so have I. We are failures in that sense. But God doesn't see us as failures. He sees us through the cross. He sees us in Christ. So that's why you and I can boldly come to the throne of grace and find grace to help in a time of need. Don't think for a minute you're going to come to pray and you're going to say, you know what? I don't think you're going to hear me, Lord, because I'm a failure. No. You can come boldly to the throne of grace. You say, I didn't have my devotions in a week. I haven't read my Bible in a month. I've been messing up. God, he is so sick of me. No. He says, I see you through the cross. It's been paid. You're my child. I love you. You get grace because of the mercy seat. So God looks down upon the, the Ark of the Covenant. He's sitting on his throne but he sees our failures through the mercy seat. What's on the mercy seat? The cherubim. The cherubim. These living creatures. They're to remind us of his mercy. With these faces that resembles the cross of Jesus Christ. Isn't that good news? Good. That's better than our team beating the Cedars beating the Cowboys. <laughs> Say it was just preseason. We'll still take it. So I displayed my cup <laughs> for everybody to see. That means you care. <laughs> yeah, perfect. <laughs> Next we play the Eagles. But I'm not paying attention anyway. I boy boycotted the NFL except for one team. I boy boycotted all of them except one team. It's not too bad. <laughs> I'm going to hide my cup now because you're being mean to it. <laughs> so God looks down upon that. That's pretty awesome. Okay, now verse 10 and 11, and we'll close with this. The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure th th they are and were created. Do you know we are created for his pleasure? So these cherubim, they worship. They're worshiping the Lord. Not like a robot just to repeat the same thing over and over again, but because they know everything. And the more that they know, the more that they are impressed and attracted to God. By the way, you know what's really, what's really attractive in this world? Holiness. We, th we might be seduced and tempted by evil. But when you get, when, when you're filled with it, it's just like the prodigal son. It's like the devil dangled before him prime rib. He promised, it's like the devil promised the prodigal son prime rib. But he gave him 
pig slop. That's what the devil gives. Sometimes we look at holiness as it's pig slop. But when we get involved with the things of God, we find out that it's prime rib from Hollywood Joe's. Yeah. So that's the, you see the, the living creatures around the throne. Seraphim, cherubim, whatever you want them to be, that can be that. I wanted them to be seraphim just because of the S. So the throne of grace. So now we see the service, the, like a church service, a worship service that's going on. The four and 20 elders, which we said before, represents the redeemed church. Some people believe it's just could be representative of something else. But whatever they are, they're redeemed and they're worshiping and they're casting their crowns before the throne. They're worshiping. That is the greatest, most exciting thing for us to do is worship. Worship the Lord. And this is the place to be, the throne room. That's the most exciting place to be, where, where, where we're serving the Lord, where we're worshiping the Lord, where we are with the people of God together in the throne room. Casting crowns <clears throat> simply acted out their declaration that he's worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. If God, was worth, if God was worthy of the glory and honor and power, then he should get the crowns. Some people believe that these crowns speak of the position of authority that we'll get. Even though they cast him at his feet, it's, they still maintain that position. You know, the things that we do as we serve the Lord is, is going to speak of or it's going to uh, have meaning of what we're going to do during the millennial kingdom. We don't know all the details of that. A lot of people believe that to be the case. I think it has something to do with that. that what we do for the Lord here on earth is going to have a, um, a significance in what we're going to do throughout the thousand-year millennial kingdom. Some are going to be, you know, I don't know, janitors. Some are going to be, you know, cleaning the bathrooms. Not that that's, a, you know, that's an important task. And there's going to be some that are going to be you know, political leaders and higher up in, in uh, positions. You know there's going to be an order of positions in, during the millennial kingdom. That's for a thousand years. Of course, then the millennial kingdom is going to merge with the eternal kingdom. There's even less in the Bible about that because I has not seen, neither has ear heard, neither has it entered the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. We can't, we can't even comprehend heaven, this side of heaven. We just got to trust him that it's going to be awesome. The crowns mentioned in Revelation 4.10 are the Stephanus crowns, the crowns of victory, not royalty. These are the crowns of achievement that a winning athlete would receive at the ancient Olympic Games. The 24 elders representing all the redeemed of God or the redeemed church through every achievement reward that they had back to God because they knew it and they proclaimed that he was the one that was worthy. I'll read this quote. There is also an allusion to a practice in the Roman Empire the emperor of Rome ruled over many lesser kings, and these kings were at times commanded to come before the emperor and lay their crowns down before him in homage. Then he would give them back as a demonstration that their crowns, their right to rule, their victory came from him. This is an allusion to the custom of the East at the homage of petty kings acknowledging the supremacy of the emperor. That could be what is in play here. Conclusion. There was cherubim, remember I said, remember that, the veil, had those cherubim embroidered. Those cherubim protected the holiness of God as the cherubim protected the, um, the tree of life from Adam and Eve that they could not partake of it. And it was placed in the veil. And it separated, the veil separated the holy place from the holy of holies. The high priest was the only one that could go in there once every year on a day of atonement to offer the blood sacrifice of the goat that was selected to be sacrificed to atone for the sins of the people. He had gone there once a year. And that's it. But that veil kept out all the other priests that could not go in there. And if they did go in there, that'd be zapped dead. In fact, do you remember um, in Beth Shemesh when they looked into the ark they lifted up the, 
You remember the movie Raiders of the Lost Ark? And then when they opened up the ark and they all disintegrated. Well, that's taken from that story in the Bible. Also, I think it's in Zechariah at the end times when they're going to be just consumed by the, the, the word of Jesus that comes out of the mouth of Jesus. But the reason why when that ark was, was lifted up, because now you remove the mercy. So now God looks down upon his violated word without basically the mercy seat. And they were all consumed, right? That's what would happen. That's why there's those cherubim. You could not just go into the holy of holies. In fact, you remember when, who was it? Uzzah? When Uzziah, Uzzah? When the ark was being transported on an ox cart, which wasn't how it's supposed to be transported for this reason, and the ox it hit a bump in the road, the cart kind of, and so Uzzah touched it to, to keep it, to stabilize it. What happened to him? He's, he was killed. He just didn't, he didn't touch it. So the inner veil separated the holy place, which contained, you know, we went, went through all that, the altar of incense, the menorah, the table of showbread, from the most holy place or the holy of holies, which contained the ark of the covenant. In Herod's temple, the veil before the holy of holies was 60 feet long and 30 feet wide. The thickness was, was, it was as thick of the palm of a man's hand. And it was so heavy that it needed 300 priests to manipulate it, like if they had to move it. 300 priests, that's how heavy it was. This veil barred all but the high priest from the presence of God once a year. But when Jesus Christ died on the cross, what happened to the veil of the temple? It was rent. A veil that took 300 priests. It was ripped. Now, you might say that, well, that could have been done. You could have cut it on the bottom and had someone pull it, but it was ripped from top to bottom. Only God could have did that. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, what did God do? He ripped the veil of the temple. Remember those two cherubim? You had one on this side, one on that side. Well, what happened? They were rent. The cherubim were removed. So now you had open access to the holy place. In Mark 15, verse 37 through 38, Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. See that? Top to bottom. Hebrews 10, verse 19 through 22 says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. So that's why it says in Hebrews 4, verse 16, let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Because that veil has been opened up to us so now we could go in there. And those cherubim represent the mercy of God once you get into the throne room. That we're reminded that God sees his violated word. He sees the commandments that have been broken. He sees our failures, but he sees it through the cross. And because of that, we obtain mercy and we can find grace there to help in time of need. Judgment's coming from the throne. We're going to see judgment in chapter 6. But right now, we're still in the throne room. If you want to be encouraged, spend time in the throne room. And we'll be encouraged because we live in a discouraging world. And if we watch the news, and if we look at social media, and we spend so much time 
and a little bit of time in the throne room, we're going to be discouraged. If we spend a lot of time with Jesus, we're going to be encouraged because we know that even though we failed, we have been forgiven because